Good morning. Good morning. We are so glad you're here. Welcome. Welcome today. Woohoo! What a way to get started. I love a dance party. We are so blessed to have you join us today. I am Laura Lee, and I will be your facilitator and guide today for this incredibly special event. You are in for such a treat. Today's insightful presenters have been walking life together for a year, and we realize that the package we collectively offer is invaluable. We knew we needed to share it with you. My goodness, these phenomenal women are going to blow you away as they pour into you today. We will address your wellness and flaws and give you tips to accept your true self. We'll look at defining what impact you want to have on the world and help you create a process to ensure that your goals are working for you so that you can live the life of your dreams and leave a legacy. We hope you soak it up, drink in every drop of humility, relate to the life lessons, and embrace the wisdom and solid guidance that these icons have to share with you. We hope to light a fire in you, to be able to love you better, to help you set goals, define your legacy, and be the most you you can be all while making the world a better place just because you're in it. With that being said, I know some of you are multitasking and working through this seminar, and if you have to, please do you. But if you're able, I encourage you to switch off the mobile and just be present in this space with us today. As I mentioned earlier, I love a dance party, and music and dance have such a profound impact on our emotional status. There is this magical combination of elements that help us to become more in tune with our emotions and how we express them. Just listening to music can reduce anxiety, lower blood pressure, as well as improve mood and help your memory. I want to prepare you to receive our gift today and invite you to listen in with us to Ben Rector and New. Turn up the volume, sing along, dance along to get us started today. I feel like new sunglasses, like a brand new pair of jeans. I feel like... chances I feel a lot like seven
Yes, yes, I love a dance party. Thank you again for being with us. We sincerely hope that today's container will leave you feeling brand new, free, and ready to shine your light. We will take questions at the end of the presentation today, but please feel free to enter any questions, comments, and cheerleading and love in the chat because we will see those and address them as we go. We're gonna to start today with my story and I'll tell you a little bit about me. I have spent a lifetime learning to overcome adversity, failing forward, if you will, and learning to live with joy regardless of circumstance. I am creative, passionate, strong, and selfless. I do brave things. From coaching and mentoring others on a journey to joy, hosting the Joyfully Raising Grants podcast and Joyfilled Custom Gift and Subscription Shop Owner, I love to help others find joy. Today, I'm going to talk with you about joy. I was sexually molested by a relative from an incredibly young age until I was almost 10 years old. I told, but no one believed me. At 12 years old, my parents separated and divorced after several rocky years of unfaithfulness. I moved with my mother into a brand new state and school district to start over. By 14, I was smoking cigarettes, getting high, drinking, you name it. At 15, I was kidnapped and sexually molested at gunpoint by a stranger. He was later convicted. At 16, I became a child. In my late teens into my early 20s, I job hopped, man hopped, you name it. I got married in my 20s and had a 25-year marriage before I discovered my husband's affairs. I have a grown daughter who is a recovering drug addict. She is serving a 40 plus year sentence due to incredibly poor decisions made during active addiction. And today I am a 55 year old single woman who is raising my granddaughter. And yes, and yet today we are gonna talk about joy. My hope today is that by sharing my story with all of the horrible, hateful and hurtful events that have led me to where I am today that you too can see the parallels of goodness that followed these horrific events. I hope to let you see how the detours led to beautiful things, and then I'll share some of the tactics I've learned along the way. My hope is that my story will become a part of your survival guide. I once told a therapist that I've lived a pretty normal life. Laugh too. <laughs> I am a piece of work. I am a work in progress. I am a work of art and I am a work of heart. I struggled a little bit in getting my thoughts together for this talk. It's really difficult for me to talk about joy without mentioning my faith. And I realized that we all have different beliefs, but the more I study world religions and the lack thereof, the more I'm convinced that we all serve the same maker. I believe that sometimes we have to know the darkness to see the light. And I think I've been through my share of darkness. Did you know that when you strike a match, only the matchstick has a shadow? There is no shadow, no darkness at all in the light. And that's really where my story begins. First John 1, 5 tells us God is light, in him there is in no darkness at all. I was brought up in and have been through most of my life very active in the church. Perfect attendance, Sunday school, youth groups, choirs, Sunday school teacher, Bible study leader, deacon, session, children's ministry director, and finally children's pastor. So even when I was in the pits of the many ugly things that have been a part of my story, 
I knew where I had to go to find light and joy. I didn't always choose to go there, but I at least knew where to go. Faith doesn't always take you out of the problem. Faith takes you through it. Faith doesn't take away the pain, but rather gives you the ability to handle it. And faith doesn't always take you out of the storm, but it certainly calms you in the midst of it. Let me link arms with you today and briefly walk you through some of my experiences, my thinking and the lessons learned from them. And I wanna be clear that if you've had some of these experiences, there may be triggers for you. And for that, I'm sorry. But what I want you to hear is the after party, the finale, the celebration for the incredible blessings and lessons that have been born from them. I also want you to know that if you've suffered from traumatic events in your life, help do therapy, work through them. You can breathe on the other side and gain new perspective. I remember God loves me and you because he is love, not because we're lovely. I was sexually abused as a child and again as a teen. And when it was happening, I was terrified, frozen, immobile. I worked up the courage to tell my mother and she didn't believe me. Not only did she not believe me, but she told me never again. Now I wanted to say that my mother was a great mom. I believe now that she just wasn't equipped to deal with the consequences of confronting that situation. Maybe she did, and I just don't know. She's gone, so I'll never know. There were really important lessons for me here. All people are not good. Bad things happen to good people. And sometimes the truth is hard to hear and even harder to respond to. I have developed a compassion for others when they are hearing hard truths. My parents' divorce was hard on me. And although when I was young, they appeared to have a very solid marriage. The last few years were really hard. From drinking and physical abuse to extramarital affairs, my lesson here, nothing lasts forever. Treasure what you have, what you love while you have it. I try to make efforts to correct my mistakes and where able, build better foundations in the relationships that are important to me. I was pregnant at 16 and there is a time, ready or not, you've got to step up and get things done. Strength comes from within. By the time I delivered my son, I had gotten my GED and finished my first year of college before my high school class even graduated. During those early parenting years, I was working, taking care of my son, going to school. I currently hold almost three degrees. In those early years, I developed a love for all things learning, whether historical, vocational, applicational, hands-on. I have continued to almost always be taking a class of one sort or another. I once thought it would be some website coding while taking an advanced biblical history course. I'm also the girl who takes honors sociology with advanced psychology in the same quarter. I also needed to quickly learn to be a parent and took many parenting courses as a teen mom to ensure I was doing all I could for my child. My son is an amazing human being. He's married with two children and they are all such remarkable foundations in my life and in my granddaughter's life. Those parenting courses came in handy later in life as I was called to be a foster parent to teens for over seven years. Job hopping, man hopping, taught me a lot about who and what I didn't want to be. Enough said about that. But really, I heard a speaker recently who was talking about changing a certain mindset in her company. And she felt like it had been turning, it was like turning a ship around. And that really struck a chord with me because in my teen years, I desperately needed to turn that old ship around. It was so needed and so hard, but that's what I did. I learned that it takes a full nautical mile to turn an aircraft carrier around. This ship is a bit over a thousand feet long and the turnaround at a nautical mile is over five times the length of the actual ship. And if the ship isn't fully committed to slowing down, it takes even longer. We've got to give ourselves grace. We've got to give ourselves grace. You can only reach a desired goal by first starting and then staying the course. Even if sometimes it feels like it's five times longer than it should be, but the easy path produces little gain. My husband's affair was a hard lesson for me personally. Some of you have been through this and it's really tough. A lesson? Sometimes doors are closed because it's time to move forward. 
let's face it, you wouldn't move unless your circumstances force you. Trust the transition. I tried so hard to make it, make it better, force it to work following the affair, and I just couldn't do it. At the time of our separation, we were still foster parenting with two foster kids and our daughter still at home. I was left with a numbing reality that in order to survive, I would have to dismantle and sell our family home, our involvement in the foster care system, and start a new job, all while taking care of me and them. It was daunting. I spent some time after the separation and divorce really focusing on me, self-development, self-love, self-care. I believe that some of my best healing came during this time, really focused on me time. It was necessary and it was hard. I even tried online dating, and that is a series of hilarious stories that will eventually become a book. I've started writing more to come on that. It was through this time that I did a lot of research and learning on happiness. Did you know that scientific research says we were wired to experience happiness, but we keep hitting the wrong buttons in our efforts to turn happiness on? As my oldest granddaughter would say, mind blown, <laughs> turn the right button on. When we are happy, when we're properly turning on the happy button, we get happier. Our brains begin to secrete chemicals that make us feel better. Bodies get healthier, immune systems get stronger. We make more money, relationships improve, marriages are more fulfilling, we live longer, and our overall sense of well being and happiness gets better. We all get trapped in this if I could have, or if I had, or if I lose 20 pounds, or if I were rich. Well, all of these are really fantastic goals to have, but science and spiritual study says that none of these things will make us sustainably happier. If you're a statistic nerd like me, you'll like this part. The math make up to happiness, according to the law of happiness, which by the way, is a great book, is 10% circumstances. You know, if things are going well, you get a lift. 50% is attributed to your internal makeup, you know, your genetics, your temperament, your constitutional factors. And the best part, the remaining 40% comes from the things you do on purpose, the things that only you control. What you do, what you give your attention to, what you give your energy to, and what you're thinking about. These are all factors that only you can control. So that left me in a place where I knew I had to take control of things for me and swift action followed. We'll talk specifics later, but this was a shifting moment for me, a life lesson for sure. I do have an adult daughter who is a recovering addict. You've heard the proverb, raise up a child in the way he should go. Well, sometimes our kids have detours as well. My youngest child, a daughter, Lacey, grew up in ho at home, just like the rest of our kids, where we taught values and faith, giving. She's a beautiful soul, always helping others, and really has others' best interests at heart. She's a high intellect, very organized, and a leader. Unfortunately, she later used these strengths for very wrong reasons. During her teen years, she struggled. This was also a time when our family obviously was not at its strongest. She started using socially in high school, but graduated. She became a licensed as working full-time in the hospitality industry. She began serving at 15 locally and later moved to a national restaurant where at the age of 21, she became the restaurant manager. She was great at her job. She loves serving people in this way and has always had a fantastic outlook on life. While still living at home, she had her daughter Lillian. And after almost two years, Lillian's father, Moved back to the area, with a couple of months, they became a family and bought a home. Unfortunately, they were users together, and things in their home went downhill quickly. They separated, and my daughter's addiction and issues related to that became even more troublesome. For me, I was ignorant of what symptoms of heroin and fentanyl use were. By this time, I was single, and we did spend time together, but she was very good at covering it up. She made poor decision after poor decision and one arrest after another until ultimately all of her various caseloads were combined and she was eventually sentenced last year. I will say this about detours in life. They don't just happen to one of us, they happen to most of us. Some are more significant than others. I am 100% certain that if my daughter was not incarcerated when she was, she'd be dead. She would have continued down a path of self-destruction until there was no life left in her. 
Today, although incarcerated, she is more faithful, more caring, healthier, and all good things, more so than I have ever seen her be. One thing I know is that my granddaughter and I are so prayed over by her. Remember how I started this topic on my daughter and her addiction, train up a child? When I first started publicly sharing my story, I asked my daughter to weigh in on this talk of joy. And here's a snippet of what she said. I've come to realize joyful living is attainable in any circumstance. With joyful living, there's a spiritual connection thrumming with God, with other people, and with our surroundings. Being joyful gives one the ability to weather any storm. We were created to thrive. When we veer off course, we get distracted from goals and forget about consequences of values. Life gets When I neglect my beliefs and boundaries, I am left feeling unfulfilled and with an absence of joy. When I'm walking God's path, life is smooth, full of life. I am strengthened, renewed of patience and understanding. I joyfully withstand all of life's storms. Circumstances, availabilities within daily life and barriers can simply not break my joy. Living a joy-filled life, life is a choice, a choice that I consciously make daily. You know, I've always loved butterflies because they remind us that it's never too late to transform ourselves. Butterflies cannot see their wings, but the rest of the world can. You and you, you're beautiful. And while you may not see it, we can. Raising Lily is my joy-filled journey. I took temporary custody of Lillian when she was four years old. I was on a cruise out of cell phone coverage when my daughter had two very serious auto accidents within three days, both under the influence and both with legal charges and arrest. My cruise ship got closer to shore the day prior to my return, my phone started blowing up with messages and calls. My daughter had called a meeting of all the parents, us and Lillian's, to talk through next steps for her, which was the first of many rehabilitation centers. I rushed off the ship on arrival and drove to arrive at this meeting just on time. What I couldn't fathom is that all of these adults in a room had just arranged a next day start rehab program for my daughter. And it was intense, it was hard, but no one said, what about Lily? So at the end of the meeting as folks separated and went home, I scooped her up and she's been with me most of the time since then. As I've talked about, I am a learner, one who always looks for resources to enhance any situation. As Lily and I got acclimated into this new living arrangement, I began searching for resources, you know, happy help and anything that would help us. And what I found was a whole lot of really angry and sad grandparents raising their grandchildren. I can still find them today. These grandparents are so wrapped up in what I like to call trauma drama, anger at their children for whatever happened to lead them to raising their grandchildren. They're destroying themselves emotionally and physically, and they're transferring all that anger and grief to their grandchildren. I knew immediately that this is not what I wanted, and I certainly didn't want this for Lillian. So I have worked to become that resource for grand families. My Heart Project, the Joyfully Raising Grands podcast, was born from this need to support the 3 million grandparents raising 8 million grandchildren just in the United States alone. Joyfully Raising Grants may eventually transition to a nonprofit and become a hub of resources for those families who very much Each of the businesses I have started since then is with the purpose of bringing joy to others. Over most of the last eight years, my daughter has remained in full active addiction or incarcerated. Lillian's daddy died from an overdose three years ago. I feel the need to reiterate that addiction is not an exclusive club. It can happen to anyone. Both of Lillian's parents <clears throat> are and were very bright, athletic, kind, and had everything going for them to addiction. I am so blessed to be able to raise Lillian. Opportunity to pour into her. I'm so glad I can do this for my and I am eternally grateful that I can do this for Lily. She is a light of goodness in the world. And those who have much struggle are called to change the world with what they have learned. Much will be asked of Lily, and I'll be here to hold her hand through it all. My lesson here 
Strong women aren't simply born. They are most often made by the storms they walk through. As a speaker and a coach, I always talk about the many, many ways to develop and maintain what I call happy habits and how you can incorporate them into your world. The wise speakers that follow me today will delve into some of these areas as well and continue this really important topic, but I'll share just a few that are so important to me. I want to take a moment just to talk about giving. I have always been a giver, a giver of my time, my money, my ideas, my counsel, my empathy. If asked or often unasked, if there's a need, I will do what I can to help. This is my core, and I believe a contributing factor to my ability to recover from tragedy. A study from the National Institute of Health showed that pleasure centers of the brain, you know, the ones that light up for food and sex, also light up when people think of giving to others. How amazing is that? If you want to increase your happiness and joy, spend some of your heart, your mind, and soul, even your money, on others. Here's a rapid fire short list of priority tactics that I love to talk about. Good morning, God morning, routine, routines, turn off your gadget and go outside. Sleep, exercise, breathe, positive thinking and speaking, affirmations, affirmations, affirmations. If you don't have a practice, make one. Positive people have negative thoughts. They just don't let it get them down. Go on and on. I recently reread a great book, um, The Miracle Morning by Hal Elrod. Some of you have read it too. In this book, Hal writes, most of us have a someday mindset. This is the highest cause of mediocrity, 95%. He goes on to say that now matters more than any other time in your life because it's what you're doing today that is determining who you are becoming. And who you are becoming will always determine the quality and the direction of your life. Make the commitment to serve you. Another great story is John Grisham. He was an attorney, a state legislator, but always wanted to be an author. He was a busy guy with a lot of responsibility, but he decided to get up early each day to write. Within a few years, he had written the novel, A Time to Kill, and has sold over 100 million books since then. Don't wait. Get started today on the activities that will make you happy and joyful, one page at a time if necessary. Life can be difficult if all you see is everything wrong. Start focusing on what's right, what's good, what's constructive. No matter what you're facing, if you choose a positive mindset, you will emerge the winner. If you want to feel better, you've got to think better. You have to stop stuck in your situation forever. We feel like our heart will never heal or we'll never get out of this impossible struggle. Don't confuse a season for a lifetime. Even your trials have an expiration date. You will grow, life will change, things will work out. Just imagine what your life can look like if you incorporate just a few of these things into your day to day. What will you do differently tomorrow? What one small thing will you incorporate into your day that will trigger the flood of joy that will change the world. Do you remember the 1980s movie, Miracle? Kurt Russell's character is speaking to the 1980 US Olympic hockey team in the locker room before they take on the Russians, which were highly favored. His speech is a great message about how the odds of success don't matter. If you only believe you can su succeed when the odds are in your favor, then you don't really believe in yourself at all. Exist, survive, thrive, what are you doing? I have a 10 year old watching me and learning from me. So surviving is not enough. Transition from surviving to thriving is necessary. You can't take responsibility for every terrible wrong thing in the world, but you can take responsibility for you. In order to do that, you need a plan, a personal roadmap. The best car in the world won't take you to the right place if you don't know where you wanna go. So make a plan. Make a joyful plan. I don't ever want people to feel sorry for me for the crazy ride I've had in this life. I wanna promote understanding, compassion, kindness. I wanna help others develop tools that will help them keep moving forward in a passion-filled life, a life full of joy. I wanna encourage you to not be dismayed by the brokenness in the world. All things break and all things can be mended. Not with time, as they say, but with intention. So go, love intentionally, extravagantly, 
unconditionally. Live life by your design. The broken world waits in darkness for the light that is in you. Oh my, oh my goodness. Laura, that was amazing. And you're getting lots of hearts and lots of clapping hands and, and people are so encouraged by your story. So I want to thank you so much for sharing your bravery, your strength, and your joy, and an incredible legacy of love and life, life lessons for many, many generations. So thank you. Yeah. Our next speaker is Miss Stephanie Keenan Reed. Stephanie has been pursuing a holistic healing and wellness journey in modalities since she was a kid. She self-taught reflexology to herself in the sixth grade, practicing on family and finding great joy in knowing the power of her healing hands. <clears throat> Excuse me. Her journey includes equine massage, aromatherapy, energy healing in Shambhala, similar to Reiki, chakra energy, and Ayurveda. She became a licensed esthetician in 2007 with a focus on spa therapy. Stephanie is a wife, a mom, a managing director for Polka Dot Powerhouse, a powerhouse herself. And Stephanie's virtual skin health and wellness business, Natural Beauties, allows her to do her heart's work, guiding others on their wellness journey. Welcome, Miss Stephanie Keenan Reed. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Oh, thank you and good morning, everyone. Um, our summit is about bettering yourself uh, so that you can go into the world around you. Um, and be better. Um, so what I wanted to talk about today is it's called more than skin deep. Um, so even the most confident seeming women, it can, at times it can be so difficult to see our own unique natural beauty from overwhelming self-criticism to the pressures to conform to society's standards we will all at some point feel pressures, self-doubt, lack of confidence, insecurities. And for most women who come to my spa room, they will literally have a laundry list of things that they see wrong with their skin. And they expect me to find even more issues. And I attribute this expectation for me, the professional, to find more flaws in their skin as a societal expectation we anticipate due to shows like Dr. 90210 and Botchdoc, where on that first visit to a plastic surgeon, they literally draw all over the their client, showing them all the things that they see that they can fix. And it's usually flaws that, quote unquote flaws, that the customer never even thought about. They didn't think we're wrong. So talk about a huge blow to your confidence. So let's take a second. I want you to just think, maybe write down a couple things like, so the first question is, what do you love about yourself? Can you just write a few things down? Maybe it's your hair, your eyes, your something about your facial structure. And now I want you to write down what you would like to improve. Which of these questions was harder for you to answer? These are two questions that I ask every single client on their first consult with me. And many people struggle with that first question. Just finding one thing that they love about themselves can be really hard for a lot of people. And this is because literally we are our worst critics. So please remember that. When it comes to societal pressures, um, I certainly have had my challenges. 
for the most part, I've always been rather confident and comfortable in my skin. But as a teen in the 90s, when heroin chic was actually a real thing, and being a size 12 ballet dancer, I knew I was never going to reach society's standards for beauty unless I harmed myself with an eating disorder or drugs, and that was not going to happen. So I found heroes and idols to look up to who appeared more full-figured and confident. Beauties like Cindy Crawford, Iman, RuPaul, and of course, Marilyn Monroe. All of these beauties use their platforms to preach that being your own person is so important, that you have to shine in your unique, natural radiance, and that loving yourself is key, and confidence is beauty. As Amon said, beauty is being comfortable and confident in your own skin. I've been an esthetician for 16 years, And I've been dabbling with holistic healing uh, since I was a kid, as Jennifer said in my intro. Um, Healing others and helping others feel more comfortable and confident in their skin is what I do. (laughs) Sorry, the the little chat keeps like throwing me off, (laughs) but I love it. (laughs) As I grew up in my, uh, as I grew up and in, and I hit my thirties and forties, I had a baby, I experienced huge hormone shifts, gained weight that I could not drop, got acne in my 40s when I barely had it as a teenager, started to see those fine lines at the same time and get some pigmentation. My confidence wavered a bit. And then I was diagnosed with an autoimmune disorder and I knew I had to level up my wellness. I also knew as a holistic esthetician, I had to help others with similar issues and challenges realize that what's happening on our skin is so much more than surface level. Um, You can't just put a magic cream on it and make it all better. You have to dig deeper. You have to look at your whole person, our health and our wellness on a cellular level from inside out. Our body systems are intricate and connected and if one aspect isn't working properly, it affects all the others and eventually will show up on your skin. Our skin health and challenges are affected by diet, hormones, stress, sleep, in the environment around us, and so much more. And there's actually this thing called face mapping. So uh, when somebody comes in with an issue on their skin, I can look at the area where it's, they're having their issue And I can connect what organs are related to that area, or if it's stress or diet issues, perhaps. And that kind of just gives me little clues and hints to help me on how to proceed further or what kind of questions to ask. My job as a holistic esthetician is to help my clients dig a little deeper, educate them on why natural solutions matter, and be a guide to help them find those customized natural skincare solutions and support for their mind, their body, and their soul, while helping them embrace their unique beauty so that they can let it shine and radiate. As RuPaul says, girl, if you can't love yourself, how the hell are you going to love somebody else? So the first step to loving yourself and embracing your natural beauty is to start on your personal wellness journey. Rather than bore you with all the science and the step-by-step points that I think are super important, I'm going to share a specific story and case that will illustrate what I do and how whole person health and wellness is um, not only matters to heal your body, but to also empower you on all levels, which frees you so that you can see your unique magnificence. I want to thank my friend Jill for letting me share her story and journey. So when we started working together, she was in her early 30s, and she would come for an occasional seasonal seasonal facial. Uh, I knew she trusted me, and I knew she knew I used all natural, good quality products, and um, and that ultimately it was just a little bit of self-care time and relaxation for her. 
At the time, she lived a very conventional life, and she was not very interested in learning more about natural solutions or living a non-toxic lifestyle. We were rather new friends, so I didn't want to be aggressively pushing her in a certain direction. Um, but slowly, she started to listen, and as I gently uh, encouraged her to incorporate more natural products. Then due to some personal life stressors, she started to re her own research and learned more about improving her lifestyle. First, she focused on nutrition and reducing the toxins in the environment around her. And then she slowly realized that she was focusing on what she put in her body, but not on what she put on her body and how that affects her health and wellness. So this was the beginning of her wellness journey. Uh, then a few years ago, she came to me in utter despair. Um, she had the most extreme case of eczema flaring up. It was one of the worst that I've ever seen. Her whole face was completely raw. The skin was thick and angry and red, cracking, and it hurt all the time. Her scalp was irritated as well. Plus, she was fighting a case of acne. Her skin was so sensitive that she could only wash with water because everything else that she used literally hurt and burnt her skin. She had lost all of her confidence and she felt like she had to hide under her makeup to look normal. Her personal goal that she set for herself with me was to get her, cle her skin clear and healed so that she felt confident enough to leave the house without makeup. Eczema is an extremely challenging skin condition, both in treating it because each case is uniquely different, but also for the person suffering with it as it adds a great deal of stress onto them. I worked with Jill and we discussed her lifestyle, her diet, her stress, um, her health history, her hormone shifts and more. Because she was in such extreme pain, I immediately shared some do-it-yourself skincare recipes, which I love because they're gentle, effective, and great for all skin types. And they leave the skin so nourished and glowing. And nourished skin is key to looking and feeling great. So the first step in topical skincare that I provided her was a pre-wash oil, a uh, cleansing oil. And this is something that I honestly tell all my clients to do. Using a nourishing natural oil like argon, olive oil, or even coconut oil with a low dilution of a custom essential oil blend that is pure and food grade is key to glowing healthy skin. To some with an oily skin type, this may seem crazy, but using a natural oil will actually help loosen up and remove dirt and debris and makeup from your pores while also soothing, healing, nourishing, and leaving your skin with a nice soft, supple uh, feel. For Jill, I gave her a custom blend of olive oil with an incredibly low uh, dilution of lavender, like literally one drop in a very large jar. Um, and this lavender was going to help calm, soothe, and heal the acne and the inflammation from the eczema on a cellular level. Jill said that this one action was the ultimate game changer. One application shifted her skin immensely. It calmed and soothed it right away. She felt her skin was far less irritated and tight and dry. She also benefited from the aroma, which calmed her mind and body while well, she applied it and she just took a few deep breaths and instantly felt that relaxation in her body. Secondly, her skin was so compromised and angry that she needed a good cleanser. Using just water or this oil cleanser was not gonna cut it. So I made her my aloe cleanser. And again, it was very soothing, healing and calming. And this was our theme with Jill soothe, heal, calm, and nourish. She loved this cleanser and she felt empowered knowing she had tools to care for her skin that were simple and beautiful, clean ingredients. Finally, she needed a customized moisturizer to protect and heal her compromised skin. Again, we kept it simple. We used just raw coconut oil. 
And the medium uh, fat, medium chain fatty acids in raw coconut oil are absolutely amazing. They contain antimicrobial, antiviral, antibacterial properties, which will help heal and soothe that acne breakout, but also protect the skin. Coconut oil also promotes natural collagen production and it helps repair our skin cells. It's ideal for a dry, sensitive, and irritated skin. If she was having an angry flare, like when we first started working together, she used just plain raw coconut oil because at this point, anything else added to it really did irritate her skin further. So we just really wanted to focus on calming it down. Once it was less reactive and it, that shift happened really quickly, um, at that point, I introduced a custom blend that was a very low dilution of lavender and thyme essential oils. The thyme essential oil, there is um, several studies that have found it to be more effective and cost efficient than traditional eczema and uh, re traditional medicines that treat eczema and psoriasis. Um, and it works so well because between the healing benefits of that coconut oil and the fact that the essential oils get into our bloodstream and go where we need it and start to heal and repair on a cellular level, it's not just a surface moisturizer. It's really working on a cellular level to heal from the inside out. So with this lotion, she was already starting to do that wellness journey from the inside out. And finally, I gave her some healing and soothing masks um, to use on a weekly basis. They were vitamins for the skin, nutrient rich and very healing. One was an oatmeal mask that actually works to gently exfoliate and remove those dead skin cells so that her um, products would work better. And the other was a French green clay mask to detoxify and nourish and balance and soothe her skin. These four topical solutions really improved her skin greatly in a very short period of time. But the eczema and acne never really stopped until we dug a little deeper. If we didn't dig deeper, she would have just continued in this cycle of in and out of flare-ups. So we took a big magnifying glass and we just looked at her whole life, her health and her wellness. Her life was lived in a constant state of stress. Her work, she had an extremely stressful, high pressure job with an overwhelming workload. And her home life, she was a caretaker for her father who struggled with many health issues. So it was full of stress and worry. Plus she had her own personal stressors and pressures which she placed on herself. Her gut health, health was a mess. She was struggling with IBS and was trying to figure out what really was causing her issues. She tried elimination diets, she saw specialists, she tried vegetarianism, veganism, raw foods, she took herbs and supplements and then stopped them to try and figure out what was working and what wasn't working. And she kind of was all over the place with that. Her sleep also suffered between being a caretaker and working late, plus sometimes only finding that quiet in the late night and just wanting to watch an episode of SVU, she seldom went to bed early, but her cat would always wake her up by 5.30 a.m. every single day, no matter what. Finally, due to stressors in her life, she found it hard to carve out time for herself and for self-care. She had been a runner, but an injury took that stress reliever away from her, and she never really got back to it. Rather, she filled her days with work and responsibilities to others. Needless to say, we needed to make some shifts and some complete 360s in some cases, but we did it slowly and steadily, step by step to help build habits that would last. Once I knew she had those topical solutions that would help her start to see and feel better, we got to work on that deeper level. We supported her foundational building blocks by focusing on her diet and gut. She made sure she was focused on eating real foods with real nutrients, with less processed ingredients so that she was feeding her body. She consumed more vegetables and focused on reducing inflammation on a cellular level. She identified that dairy and gluten 
were her two biggest issues. And in cutting them out, her diet uh, of her diet, her digestion issues greatly improved and some of her acne calmed down as well. She supported her body with high quality vitamins that would support her cellular health and vitality. And recently she was introduced to a collagen, um, which is key to glowing skin. But with collagen, you need to make sure it's sustainably sourced provides su superior absorption with liposomal tripeptides and contains multiple types of collagen. Our bodies actually have 28 types of collagen in it. And most of the collagens on the market only have one or two types that really just support the hair, skin, and nails. We want to support those, but we also want to support our joints, our gut, our organs, our minds, so much more. In healing her gut, that was really quite key. Um, she used food and supplements um, like digestive enzymes and probiotics to boost her uh, gut biome health. And that way she could easily absorb the food's nutrients that she was consuming and support her immune system. There's a huge connection between our immune system, our brain, our mood, and our health in relation to our gut health. Um, and so this was key to healing on many, many levels. Stress, sleep, self-care, those were our next big focuses. Sleep is so important to shifting our body's wellness. Creating a good sleep ritual and habit is self-care. When we get better sleep, we reduce inflammation in our bodies. Sleep is our time for our bodies to actually heal themselves on a cellular level. So she started to create a healthy bedtime ritual, implementing good sleep habits. It took a little time for her body to shift, but she noticed a big difference um, both in her mind and her body, as well as her skin. We discussed incorporating self-care rituals and body rituals. We had built that proper skincare practice, but even applying our daily skincare, you can either slap it on or you can create a two second mini ritual. Inhale those aromas as you apply your skincare. Feel your body relax and know that you're in charge of caring for your skin, nourishing and feeding it on a cellular level. As Carol will discuss in more detail, we can set intentions to what we want and how we wanna do things and really shift our worlds. And it's the same with our, our health and wellness. There are many whole body rituals that are amazing. And here are a few that I really love. Dry brushing is one of the easiest. You literally just use a brush and brush your body. It exfoliates your whole body. It stimulates your blood flow, increases our circulation. It moves the lymph, which helps assist in our body's detoxification. One time a week, just for a few minutes before a shower, it's fast, it's easy, it's effective. And then my absolute favorite body rituals or self-care rituals is to mask and meditate. This helps you reduce stress, stack some habits, and focus your time on you, doing something you love for 20 minutes while you put on a mask and take care of your skincare. You just wanna make sure that you're relaxing in some way. So you could read, you could take a bath, you could meditate, listen to music, do some art, journal, do breath work, um, zone out and watch your favorite show. Just be sure that you are doing something to focus on you and make it your time with that focus on relaxation and giving yourself 20 minutes whether it's an, an at least one time a week. Finally, you have to find your joy. As Laura spoke about finding joy in life, it can be challenging, but it's key and it is a choice. What makes you happy? What are you doing for fun? What are you doing to reduce stress? As I mentioned, Jill was struggling to find time for herself and to have joy in her life. She was burdened with those stress and the responsibilities. And as she made those many little shifts, she started to prioritize herself, her self-care. And so she started with uh, scheduling facials and float times and massage 
spending time with her friends as often as she could and pursuing laughter and having fun. She still couldn't run, but she really enjoys nature and going for hikes. And as often as possible, she takes hikes with her friends to find her joy. These shifts that she made naturally built healthy boundaries around her work habits. She no longer stays up regularly working on projects and she prioritizes a healthy work-life balance. With all of this, her skin got so much better. She rarely has eczema flare-ups. And when she does, she knows how to think about what's happening and what to do to care for her whole health. She actually reached her goal of leaving the house without makeup long before her skin was actually clear. Once her skin had calmed down, she amazingly became so much more confident just knowing that she was in control of her skin and her body and helping it heal. She stopped masking her, her face with makeup before it was completely clear. And now she never wears makeup. And maybe occasionally she'll put a little on for a special event, but even then it's just maybe some eyes or some lips, something that's gonna actually just highlight and accentuate her personal natural beauty. As Cindy Crawford said, the face you have at 25 is the face God gave you, but the face you have after 50 you earned. So will you care for your health and wellness on a cellular level and shine in your natural beauty? Everything we do in life and the attitude we have about it plays a role in our health and wellness. So as Marilyn says, be real, be yourself, be unique, be true, be honest, be humble, be happy. Thank you. Yay! Thank you so much, Steph. Such amazing tips and insight into just simple steps that we need to take every day. Thank you so much for sharing. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to Carol Ward. Carol is an interesting combination of heart, health, and geekness. Her careers have been as an accountant, an IT director, and now master energy healer. They have led her today. She is passionate about helping others connect to who and what they need by sharing the information she learns each day. Carol's journey was paved by saying yes to the voice inside her that guided her along the way to learn and connect. Now she wants to share with you how and have the <laughs> now she wants to share with you how you have the power to live a life by design, not default through intention and gratitude. Carol, take it away. Thank you, Laura. That was amazing. Stephanie, as always, love, love, love listening to you. You have so many insights that really I forget about because that dry brushing, I am definitely going to be using that again. I have it hanging in my bathroom and I always forget to use it. So anyway, thank you. And thank you all for coming today. I am the geek. That's why I have a spread uh, PowerPoint here. And I absolutely love to create. So part of creating a talk for me is about creating the, um, the PowerPoint that goes with it. So Today, I want to talk to you about waking up and choosing your happiness, because I don't know about you, but waking up in the morning can be interesting. I have a question. How do you start your day? Do you start it by maybe rolling over and hitting that snooze alarm, not quite ready for the day, not really wanting to get up and face whatever's going to go on that day? Or do you actually wake up and embrace whatever it is and make choices about how your day is going to flow? Well, it truly is a choice. Not everyone believes that, but you are in control. Your mood is going to be what you decide. 
Yes, we have stressors as Laura and Stephanie both talked about. There are so many stressors that we come up against every day, but if you choose to be happy when you wake up in the morning, you will be able to come back to that feeling all day long. The energy around what you put into those first moments are going to drive you for a much better day. And Jennifer, who's already who spoke and you'll hear more from later, she likes to wake up fabulous. So I am going to go from happy to fabulous. And I just love being able to have that choice in the morning. Did you know that you're also in charge of setting your intentions for the day? You can check your self-talk in the morning. That is going to go a long way. These are all things that we're going to talk about a little bit more. And all of this combines so that you can show up and affect the world in the way that you want to affect the world. Because who we are and how we show up affects everything and everyone around us. So you get to decide. And as Stephanie was talking about those, those rituals and um, Laura with the Hal's um, Morning Miracle book, start your morning intentional. Give yourself that time to reflect. So I want everybody to sit with me for a moment and just think about that. I want you to breathe in. Bring your hands to your chest, to your heart, and just anchor who you are. Checking in. I know I love doing that. I can bring myself back to that all day long if I get off kilter. And I have a meditation that I've done that's a morning visualization to really be able to set your day on the right path. You may be somebody who likes to listen to positive affirmations or read them. Um, please, whatever it is that you can do to spark that joy and that positivity every day, do it for yourself. As we've talked about, there's so many websites, books, music can just lift your mood and your vibration instantly. That's why we had our dance party at the beginning. And that's one of the things that you can do anytime, anywhere. Yes, I do dance in my office on a regular basis. <laughs> so another thing that I like to do in the morning to really kind of set my intention for the day is I'll pull an oracle card and see what the guidance for the day and where I might be able to better focus my energy for the day. So I simply pull one card. Some people pull many. I have a deck that I'm currently using. And it really helps me to dig in and think about why this card is important today and how I might be able to better live my life. Something else that um, we've talked about is meditation and breath work. So those are all beautiful ways to start your day and then set that intention. We're going to talk more in detail about that, but setting an intention will guide you throughout your day so that you can always bring yourself back to course, regardless of what side trips we take. So self-talk, many people have trouble looking at themselves in the mirror. So here's a challenge that I have for all of you. At some point during the day today, if you can give yourself a moment, look deep into that mirror, give yourself a beautiful smile and see who that is in the mirror. You're gonna check in with them. And then I want you to say, I love you. And if you want to take it a step further, I love my body. I love my flaws. I love my imperfections. 
I love everything about me. And at the end, you can breathe in and realize I am love. These things are going to help you throughout your day to be able to have that mindset, the language around how to embrace a more positive lifestyle. The power of language. It really is an inside job. You've got to start with you like we did with the morning self-talk. How about this quote from Charlotte's Web? With the right words, you can change the world. It is so true, so poignant that if you look around and see someone who's having a bad day, you might want to think about the language that's being used around them. Listen to yourself. What words are you using when you talk? Are you saying things like, I can't, I don't, I won't? How about if you change that up and say, I prefer to spend my time elsewhere. I prefer to spend my money in another place. I prefer to do this activity. Those options are so much kinder to yourself and trigger a completely different response. When you show up on Facebook, what are you posting? Are you posting positive insights? Are you posting positive conversations? How are you commenting on people? Are you using um, the likes in a way that is positive? I know personally, I was so excited when they came out with something more than a thumbs up, thumbs down. I don't even know if they had a thumbs down. Um, but I'm very cognizant about what I use for those emojis. I use a thumbs up, I'll use the heart, I'll use a laugh, and I'll use the, oh, really? Other than that, I stay away from anything negative because promoting that negativity out there is something that I don't want to be a part of. I want to always be a part of raising the vibration of everyone around me. And by doing that, making this a better world for all of us. Are you shooting on yourself? It's a, it's a term that we've heard many times, I think. And it really hit me how many times a day I say the word should. And now instead of saying I should do that, it's like, let me think about that. Or when can I make time for that? Shooting on yourself just gives you that feeling of you're not producing, you're not performing, you're not worthy because you're constantly putting yourself down with that phrase. And what we're trying to do is lift you up and be positive so that all day long, every day is a much better experience. Are you apologizing all over the place? Here's an exercise that you can do for the rest of the day. See how many times you start or you do say the word sorry. You may be saying it, you may be writing it in an email or a text or something. Stop and pause a moment. Are you really sorry? Stop apologizing for things that you're not truly sorry about. And just find a new language around that. You'll be amazed at how many times you do start to say that. I was recently introduced to this and was just surprised. So every time it starts to come out of my mouth, I sit, I rephrase and think of a positive twist on what it was that I was actually trying to convey. And I know that you can do it too. How about I need to? Well, when you say that you need to, it places that pressure on you to get something done. How about if you say that you want to do something or you get to do something? It's a much higher vibration and it's gonna feel so much better when you get to go mow the lawn or walk the dog or I don't know, go to the grocery store. 
These are all things that you actually, as a human being and an able human being, it's a privilege to be able to do these things. So instead of needing to do things, think about it in a different light because language is so powerful. And then lastly on this, are you grateful? You may think that you are. You may say that you're grateful once in a great while. But are you truly grateful? Do you tell people, thank you? Do you appreciate things that are done for you? People who come into your life, things that they say, things that you have. There is such an amazing gift in saying thank you. So why do we do this whole intentional thing? Um, setting our intention, watching our language. Well, the energy around a word and action is so powerful that when we are intentional, we can center and align our own personal energy so that we can show up in this world as a much stronger individual. It's gonna make us more productive, whether at work or at home. It's gonna make us more purposeful in our actions throughout the day. It's actually gonna cause happiness, which I don't know about you, but I kind of enjoy happiness. Um, it's gonna promote better health just by being intentional. And it's going to open the door to new opportunities because you are now going to be focused and aware of what's going on around you. So being present is also a part of being intentional. So what is an intention? How do we put one together? Well, I'd like to start with how do you want to show up in the world? Do you want to be showing up as someone who's in control of their day, their actions, their abilities? Or do you wanna show up as a whirlwind of chaos? It's up to you, completely up to you. Centering yourself will help you to show up as the person that you wanna be. What mood, what mindset? Again, your choice. All of these things are within your control. And how do you want to be supported? This is a key for me because personally, I don't ask for support very often. I haven't, um, I don't know. I just don't even think about it. So to stop and take a moment in the morning to say, how do I want to be supported today? Is it that I need someone, I would like to have someone keep me accountable for something? Would I like to have someone help me out with some errands? Would something else, an organization perhaps, be able to support me on something? These are things that are all part of setting that morning intention. So think about what it is that would support you the best and help you throughout your day. And, and then put it together and craft what your best possible outcome is for today. How could this day go by, go down absolutely perfect? Not to say that it's going to, However, if we don't have an intention for how we want it to come about, we won't get the results that we think we should have. And once you put this whole thing together, and it literally should take you about two minutes to be able to come up with this, the more you do it, the easier it becomes, then it's time to set out your belief. Do you believe that this intention is good, do you believe that you're worthy of this intention? In order for you to anchor this as a true intention for your day, you need to move beyond the words. 
Because yes, as we've talked about, language is key. And you want your language to also be about what you do want. Leave out anything that you don't because it's all about what you do want. Once you've said those words, I want you to see it, feel it, hear it, and completely embody it. And then as I like to do with so many things, lock it in with your hands on your heart and really breathe into that feeling that you've now evoked and then let it go. That intention has been set. The world around you is going to help respond the way you need it to, simply by setting that intention. So we talked a little bit already about gratitude. When you live in a state of gratitude, you are going to have improved moods, the endorphins are gonna fly. Your cognition is so much better because it's improving your health. It's giving you a better outlook. Your health is in so many ways, improving your sleep, your immune system, your mental strength, your empathy. And by improving empathy, you're reducing the aggression around you because you're more aware of what other people's feelings are, what other people's emotional states are. And you're able to diffuse aggression simply by living in a life of gratitude. It also promotes a better spiritual connection. Your faith is increased. You see the synchronicities in your life. And your relationships improve. And Again, relationships, it's all an inside job. If you're better on the inside and taking care of yourself on the inside, loving yourself, like um, Stephanie was talking about and her friend Jill, getting into a better space personally is going to improve yourself externally. So how do you get into it? a little bit of gratitude. Well, you can practice it on a regular basis by simply making a list of maybe three to five things along with three to five people. And then share the gratitude because you've made your list of the things and the people that you're grateful for. But now take it that next step out. Share it to the people in your world. Talk to strangers, tell them when you go to the store, tell them, wow, love that blouse. Love how you're showing up today. People will radiate simply by having that compliment. And then reach out to the people around you, your contacts, your friends, your family, your clients, let them know that you appreciate them. There are so many ways to do this so many opportunities to be able to show your appreciation. You can call them, you can text them, instant message, whatever your modality is or all of them, use it because people need to feel wanted, loved and appreciated. And living with a practice of gratitude is gonna help not only the people you reach out to, but it's gonna come back to you. So live with that life of gratitude and remember you are in control. Today is completely up to you. You can either live a life by default or you can choose to live by design. Thank you so very much. That's awesome, Carol. Thank you so much for sharing. I knew that this would be an amazing presentation and you have just um, put so many reminders <laughs> in, my, in my head of things that I need to get back to. I love the idea of an inside job, uh, for, especially for words, for language. It's I have all over my house, I have words and, and things, affirmations. So I appreciate the confirmation on that. Thank you. Thank you. 
you. For your next segment, the beautiful Linda Hollenbach will guide us from here on the impact and importance of relationship building. Nine years ago, after several family losses provided the repeated reminder of how fleeting life is, Linda left her career in higher education to fulfill a life dream of traveling cross country. Three months and 18,602 miles later, she returned to Pennsylvania, and the following spring, May of 2015, she launched Hollenbeck Consulting to share what she has learned about college and life to help young teens and young adults step forward confidently in their journey from high school to successful. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Laura, for that introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, give a shout out and, and another round of applause for both or for all Laura, Stephanie, Carol, um, for a really great start to our day and for these powerful stories and, and tips that they've shared. I want to take a minute since we're kind of that second half of, of the summit. Take a quick minute, stand up, stretch out, do a little shake, get get the energy flowing. I know, you know sometimes the, the tush can get a little sore after sitting for a while. So make sure you're, you're uh, getting that blood flowing again as we go into the, the second half, as we take and build on these powerful lessons about joy, about wellness and self-care, about intention and, and setting setting the life that we want. That's what we're here for today. So again, I'm Linda Hollenbach. I'm a college and career strategist and, and founder of Hollenbach Consulting. And my personal mission is to empower the next generation to create a kinder, healthier, and more just world. And I work with the teens and young professionals at helping them to get clarity and confidence and build the professionalism and the skills to help them to tell their story effectively to get to their next step, whether it be college or jobs or internships, and to build the, the life that they desire. And so why is that important? Why, why is that important for you to know as we, we talk today? The foundation question, the foundational question that I ask every student, every young person, and young professional that I work with is not about what do you want to be when you grow up or, or what job title are you striving for? To me, that is very limiting. And so what I ask them, and oftentimes the adults in their life are like, I don't know the answer to that, but I think it's important to be asked because it's when that seed is planted, when that question is asked, that the magic can happen. And that question is, what impact do you want to have on the world? So write that down for yourself. What impact do I want to have on this world? And Regardless of where you are in life stage, whether you're a student, young professional, stay-at-home caregiver, you know, entrepreneur, seasoned professional, in job transition, thinking about job transition or about to retire, ask yourself that question. Sit with that question. Build on maybe some of the tips Carol just shared about really um, thinking about the, the words that you choose and the intention that you want to set. What impact do you want to have on the world? And I believe this question is super powerful for, for several reasons. Like it creates greater opportunity for life satisfaction and professional success because it creates greater space for curiosity, for creativity, for flexibility. What I often talk to my students about, a lot of times, especially when I'm working with the high school kids on their journey to college, there's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of stress in the world right now. There's a lot of shoulds as Carol mentioned, we need to work to help lift that burden from our young people. They feel this pressure that if I don't get into that particular college, or if I don't take that one class, or if I don't get that perfect score on that one SAT or ACT test, you know, my life is over. I won't be able to get where I want to go. And so what I often explain to them is that life is very similar to your GPS that you use on your phone or in your car, right? Whether you're using Waze or Google Maps or Apple Maps, doesn't matter. When you put in your destination, and for me, that destination is what impact you wanna have on the world. That's what I call their North Star story. When we put that destination into a GPS, you don't just get one path. Our GPS provide us with three different options, possibly more, right? And once you pick which one you want to take, maybe you're feeling like the highway or maybe you're looking for the scenic 
byways of the you know, by roads like I did on my my journey around the country. You start on that path, but maybe there'll be construction or maybe you see, wow, there's a carnival going on down there that I'd like to check out or a great, you know, little boutique or a fabulous restaurant that someone tells you about, right? Whatever that is, whether it's a forced detour or whether it's a detour of your choosing, your GPS doesn't shut down on you. It doesn't go, womp, womp, you're not going to get there now. Sorry, game over. You turned left too soon. It says recalculating, rerouting. And that's the way that we need to start thinking about life and we need to start sharing uh, the journey of life with our young people, that they have that flexibility. They can be flexible. They can take one step, see what they see. And if they don't like what they see, they can turn back and try again and recalculate. So again, no matter where you are in your life, whether it's for yourself or for the people in your life, your you know, young people in your life or other family members, I want you to remind them that they can recalculate, that they can make choices. They can take a step forward and take a left turn or a right turn or choose another path, right? So when you're thinking about the impact that you want to have, similar to what Carol said, and, and also what, what Stephanie shared, we need to start with ourselves, with asking those questions, with building that relationship with ourselves about what impact do we wanna have, getting quiet with that. What do I, how do I want to live my life? You know, what are my strengths and gifts that I can bring to the world? And sometimes those strengths and gifts aren't, you know, some of them we might know immediately, some of the times we struggle to ask her and answer that question. We might be feeling a little stuck and not sure what we're good at. I challenge you to think about the times in your life, whether it be in your professional life or personal life, when the people around you have come to you, they come to you asking for advice or asking your help with something. You're like, sure, no problem, because that's easy for you. More than likely, that's a signal of a strength that you may even take for granted because it comes so naturally for you. As part of my journey, as, as Laura mentioned, I had some losses in my life. Um, in college, my aunt passed away at age 45 from lung cancer. Less than a decade later, my, my dad ended up with Lou Gehrig's disease. And my dad lived life. I mean, he did enjoy and travel and do, but he had a lot of plans and goals for retirement. And unfortunately, Lou Gehrig's disease cut his life short. At 55, he was gone right before the time that, you know, my final, my youngest sister had come out of college and that was getting ready for him to retire and he didn't get to see retirement. And so these lessons in life taught me that life is precious and short and retirement, you know, might not be there, might not be what you think. And so you have to live life now and you have to live fully now. And so that's where I took that leap and did that trip for myself and came back thinking about all of the different career paths. I've always been an educator, but I started asking, how do I want to serve? How can I bring my strengths? What is it that in all the different roles that I had throughout education, throughout working in colleges and universities, being a, a high school teacher, being in charge of community service clubs, you know, um, helping to build alumni community and student connection, what were the common threads? And for me, it was helping people to see the, the forest through the trees that they were describing and helping them to leverage the connections and build community in order to take those next steps. Because what I always tell my students is that you are the CEO of your success, but the truth is that no CEO does it alone. The smartest, most successful people know that relationships are really that key to success. Working with, learning from others is what helps you to learn, to grow, to be your best self, to re-achieve that full potential and make that greatest impact. You know, I feel like we often miss this when we talk with our young people, you know, particularly, again, the, the, the young people in high school and early college as we're helping them to build their independence, helping them, telling them, you know, you need to start taking responsibility. You need to be accountable for your actions. Yes, that is all true. And it is important to build those skills, that resiliency, that self-reliance. 
But we forget about the other half of that, that in the independence, in building your independence, in being the CEO of your success, you also have to equally learn to build your interdependence. The fact that we are all connected, that in your success is my success and my success is your success. We are both the leading actress, actor, as well as the supporting actor or actress in all of our stories, in all of our lives, right? And so we have to be aware of that interdependence and we have to be open to it. Asking for help can be hard, but it is a sign of strength and not weakness. So that reflects again what Carol was saying, how and what and who do we need to be supported today? Sometimes that support can come from within us, but sometimes it needs to come from, from without, from the outside, from the resources and the village and the community that, that we have built for ourselves and that we can need to continue to grow and foster. There are times in our lives when those relationships feel really close and sometimes where we feel isolated. And some of that is on us and sometimes it can be situations, but we can reach out. And people are often and almost always happy to reach back, right? This is particularly hard for teens, you know, as they're trying to stretch that independence muscle. But it's also very hard for some of us adults too. Carol said, sometimes I forget to ask for help. But CEO, as the CEO of your success, all the CEOs of the world, big companies, small companies, they have teams, they have board of directors, they bring in consultants. All the celebrities, all the people that we look at on our social media or in our news feeds who make it look so easy, make life seem so easy that they have it all together and you know their, their hair is always perfect and their makeup and their skin is all, all of that. The truth is that they have an entire entourage of people helping them make it look easy from their housekeepers to their chefs, to their personal trainers, to their makeup, to their wardrobe, to their agents. They've got a complete entourage that helps them put out that image of, of perfection and easy. But it's it's not true, their, their life's messy too. And so it's okay to ask for help and to build your entourage, to build your village, right? If we all utilize the resources and the people that are around us, you know, imagine what we can achieve. Imagine how you can, can have that impact. One of my favorite, uh, there's a quote, an African proverb. It says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. How true. Again, you are the CEO of your success. But no CEO is succeeding alone. So thinking about that, thinking about your relationships, you know, oftentimes in the professional world, we call it your, your network. You know, what is networking? Interacting with others, exchanging information developing connection, building those strong relationships. It requires reciprocity. It's give and take, right? It's building trust. What else is important to you in your relationships, right? Thinking about that. It's used in professional life, networking, and, and for many, I mean, I know a lot of uh, professionals. I've, I've done career coaching even for seasoned adults and C-suite. Sometimes networking <laughs> drives sheer terror, right, into the heart. You know, you imagine these stuffy rooms and people shoving business cards in your face, but it doesn't have to be that way. I can say today's event is in part from what started for me as networking. It was an opportunity. I joined a group in order to connect and meet other people, to grow my business, to understand, you know, what else I could be doing to, to go to the next level. But what I quickly learned is that true networking is is far more important when you build strong relationships, when it's not about what, what can I get, but what can I give? So think about those relationships and how do you build them? When do you build your relationships? Where do you build them? And with whom do you choose to build your relationships, right? I challenge you to think about networking and connection differently. Build and nurture those relationships to, to help you learn and grow, meet new and interesting people. As again, Carol kind of right there in synergy of who might you talk to? Going in curious, going in flexible, kind of like that GPS. 
being open to the detour of a really great conversation or a new opportunity that may be different than what you had in mind, but aligns to the impact that you're trying to have on that world. Really thinking about going into events of meeting new people, asking yourself, who can I meet today? What new thing can I learn about somebody that I already know, right? Because even when the people that we know in our lives, we often only know just a small glimpse of their, their big world. I can say I've known these women. This, today's event is the course of a year of us getting to know each other and supporting and uplifting each other and building connections and supporting our business, but also supporting each other personally. And yet, even still, even after a year of, of getting to know each other, I learned new things about each one of these ladies through this event. And so who can you meet? Who can I learn something? What one they learn new thing can I learn? How can I help one person today? How can I maybe make one connection for someone else to benefit them in their personal or professional life? And then always think about finding at least one person, come away from every event with one person that you'd love to have another conversation with. How can I have a coffee chat? Not with any expectation or you know, intention to sell them something, but with the intention of getting to know them and seeing how you might benefit and grow from each other, right? One of my favorite tools in the process and something that I wish more schools were teaching teens about, and I've been actively trying to reach out into youth-oriented groups to talk about, is informational interviews. It's a great tool to learn. So if you are someone, you know, whether you are in a, you've got a business or you're in career transition or you're in a job that you, in an industry that you love, don't forget about the informational interview tool. Have a conversation with someone who's a little farther along in your career journey or in another part of your industry, or maybe working within your company a longer time than you have. Ask questions, get curious about them and their journey. It's a great tool for exploring or considering getting new ideas and starting to practice sharing that impact that you want to have. Because each time you share it, new ideas may pop. I'll be honest, I never really thought of myself as an entrepreneur. I, I was an educator. I never thought about having a business. That really wasn't my, my intention. But it was in thinking through and having conversations with the people in my life, past colleagues, et cetera, talking about the skills that I've loved and the different jobs that I've had, that more than one of them said to me, you know, Linda, what you're describing, you would be great at. That really does fit you. And it could be, it would serve a need that is there and, and you could do that. And that's where Hollenbach Consulting was born. I didn't come back from my trip going, I'm going to start a business it kind of became an, I'm an accidental entrepreneur. And not to say that everyone's journey is the same or that you'll become an entrepreneur if you're not, but you don't know what possibilities, what doors, what detours might come where you can have that choice to decide whether you want to recalculate your route. So it's a small world. You never know when that connection, when that right connection will come in or who knows someone who might know someone that might open that door or open your mind to a new opportunity. So be curious, be flexible and have those conversations. And similar again to Carol is always be kind and always show gratitude. When you have those great conversations, when you meet someone at a family event or a friend's house or a networking event, you know, send a little note to say, thank you. Thank them for, and let them know that you enjoyed meeting them. You appreciated them sharing their nugget, their life with you. So important to show that gratitude. And it does come back and it does fill you up. And as you tell your story, for me, I think about the there are, you know, three Ps for me. When you're telling that story, if you're struggling to tell your story or think about how you want to share your, your impact um, with the world, think about your passion. What do you care about? What do you love? What lights you up? What's your purpose? How do you want to make that difference? How do, you, how do you really feel that your passion can be utilized for the benefit of the world? Big or small, I mean, we don't have to necessarily create world peace or, 
or cure cancer. Although if you can do either, I am here to cheer you on for either of those. But also then what is your, your power? I like to say superpower, but three Ps works better than two Ps and an S. So your, what's your power, your superpower? What are your strengths, right? What do you bring to the world? What do you bring to the people and the organizations and the, the jobs and the teams and the clients that you serve? Bring that together. So again, I'm Linda Hollenbach. I'm a college career strategist. My mission, my passion is to empower the next generation to create a kinder, healthier, and more just world. And I do that by helping teens and young adults get clear and confident in how they tell their story in the job and college search process. So how are you going to take it forward? How are you going to share your gifts? How are you going to make a difference? And what impact do you want to have on the world? Thank you for being here with us today. I hope you get some great nuggets to take away. Linda, thank you so much for sharing. I just have gotten so many tips uh, related to relationships and things that we just need to remember to take the time to do. Thank you. Well, we have built a foundation of wellness, well-being, and building better relationships. And now it's time to turn the tables a bit and put what we've covered into action. We have a powerhouse duo to close us out this afternoon. I am excited to introduce Wendy Lawson. Wendy spent two decades as a music marketing executive, but after Kenny Rogers ruined her wedding anniversary, Wendy Lawson traded in her backstage pass for graphic tees and created a system to help her clients achieve their goals without burnout and overwhelm. A goal-slaying ninja, she believes the only thing you should wing is your eyeliner. She is powered by cold brew coffee, gifts, and 90s hip hop. Wendy? <laughs> Thank you, Laura. And listen, uh, we didn't practice this before, but you said gifts and not gifs. And so you did that right. Because I say I'm powered by gifts, not Yay! gifs. <laughs> so awesome. Thank you so much. Um, Y'all, I can't even, this has been so fantastic. The one thing I have that I've, well, I'm not going to say the one thing I've learned, but one thing that surprised me that I learned um, is that I don't know how to spell lavender. Just saying, I was taking notes on everybody and I was like, I don't think I spelled lavender right on Stephanie's uh, presentation today. So learning all kinds of things today. Uh, ladies, hello. Hello. I am Wendy. Uh, got the cat eye today because that's, a, I believe, the only thing we should wing. And what I want to talk today is, about today is... How are we going to take all the things that we've, you know, learned today and implement them into our lives? How are we going to make some changes? How are we going to set some goals? And when we really think about creating a life by design, as opposed to a life by default, a lot of that comes back to our goals, the things that we're pursuing and that we're working towards. And so really what I want you to be able to walk away with from today's call, um, number one is I want you to have a completely different perspective on how you set your goals, the purpose your goals serve, right? Have a different perspective and a different way of looking at goals in general, so that you're actually excited about you know, setting them and then even more excited about achieving them. Okay. Cause that's what we're about. Yes. And then I never want you to set another smart goal again, because smart goals are dumb. Mm. Mm. I said it. Oh yes, I did. All right. So, you know, we don't need to talk about what a goal is. I mean, I'm pretty sure everybody here knows what a goal is. We've all probably set goals. In fact, the most common goals, according to people who do research, calling Carol, Carol's heart. No, who was my, who was the nerd that loved, who was the nerd? Who was the nerd that loved uh, statistics? Linda, I uh, no, Laura, that was you. All right. So all about the statistics here, or maybe it was Carol. I don't know, you guys. It's all soup at this point. We've been together for a little bit this afternoon. Here are some of the most common statistics when it comes to goals. So a whole group of nerds here. I love it. You're my people. Number one goal, the number one goal among people who set goals. Okay. So among the like goal setters, 80% of goal setters set goals around personal health and fitness goals. Right. And what's the number one goal? I want to lose weight. Right. I want to work out more. So fitness is number one. 
Number two is finance. Like we set a lot of finance goals. We want to save more money, want to make more money. Uh, then we come into uh, career goals, right? Especially for people that are a little bit younger. About 40% of people who set goals are setting relationship goals or social goals. And then I thought this one was really interesting. About a third of the people who set goals claim to claim, claim to set uh, religious or spiritual goals. And I think that's fantastic. And what we see as we're looking at sort of the data around people who, the types of goals that people set, we see it covers all aspects of our life, right? It's not just about uh, fitness. It's not just about money, but people are also setting relationship goals, career goals, spiritual goals. And that's fantastic because, you know, goals are how we get to where we want to be. But too often when we're living by default, right, we end up setting the wrong goals. And I don't know about you, mm, I've set a wrong goal or 10 in my life. If you can imagine, if you can imagine this right here was supposed to be an attorney. When I was a young child, I was smart. I was, I was uh, an only child. My parents were very young when I was born. It was just me. I had the vocabulary of an adult. Like I walked around, you know, at like four years old, like having like conversations with people, um, never really acted like a little kid because I was always around adults. Uh, my stepfather actually called me the 40 year old midget because I literally had a vocabulary like a grown up when I was very young. So it was always assumed that I would go to law school. And I didn't realize this until I was an adult. But when you tell a child, oh, you've got a future lawyer there, what you're really saying is, oh, you've got somebody who likes to argue and has strong opinions and is uh, a little obnoxious over there. That was me. I was that child. I've known since I was a little, little girl that I was going to go to law school. And this was a big deal because my parents were uh, 17 and 19 when I was born. No one in my family had ever gone to college. And so not only was I going to be the first person in my family to go to college, it wasn't even just undergrad. Like they had it all mapped out. She's going to be an attorney, right? And so this was, it was known just like uh, on Game of Thrones. Like they say, it is known, okay? It was known that this is what was going to happen. So I graduate high school, get into college, studying um, journalism because I love to write. That was like my undergrad was going to be my, my major was journalism. And then my minor, this is fantastic. I love this so much. My minor was in rhetoric. Who studies rhetoric as a minor in college? Uh, the girl that's going to go to law school, right? The one that wants to argue all the time. Uh, I love the things I learned in my rhetoric class. My husband, not so much because, mm, I can break down his argument just like that. Logic and reasoning, my jam. Fast forward to my junior year of college, and it's time for me to take the LSAT because that's the test you need to take if you're going to go to law school. And so I'm studying and I'm doing the courses and I've got the book and I'm doing all the things. And it suddenly occurs to me that if I go to law school, what's going to happen afterwards is that I'm going to be a lawyer and I don't want to be a lawyer. Like, I don't mind going to law school. I think it would be interesting. I would enjoy it, but I don't want to be a lawyer. Like, can you imagine this graphic tee, shaved head, cat eye in the courtroom? And the judge is like, uh, you're out of order. I'm like, no, you're out of order. Like, I no, this is not, <laughs> that is not the right next move for me. And I almost didn't notice it. I almost didn't catch it. I had been working on this goal of going to law school for as long as I can remember, but it was that moment of knowing what's next. If I achieve the goal that I realized this is not the right goal for me. 20 year old me figured that out. Uh, I've made a lot of wrong goals since then, but that was the first time that I realized I was allowing my life to be lived sort of by default and not by design. And if you've ever set a goal and you're thinking like, is this the right goal for me? I'm going to give you a little tool. Um, I'm going to give you a little exercise. You can do, do that at the end, but I really want you to think as you're looking at Right. It wasn't my goal. It was my parents' goal. That's right, Joe. It was 100% their goal, but I bought into it. I listened. Right. And so in a way it did become my goal. Um, 
But when I realized it wasn't the right goal, I was ready to pivot. I was ready to change and, and make that move. But when you're setting your goals, and if you think maybe you've got a goal that's not the right goal for you, or maybe you've gotten off uh, off course, maybe you're letting other people have too much influence. Like that's kind of what happened with me was too much influence on your goals. Really sit down and ask yourself, if I achieve this, how will I feel? How will I feel? Like for me, when I sat down and said, if I achieve this goal of going to law school, how, how will I feel? I'll feel terrified. I'm filled with dread. I don't want that career. And I certainly don't want my parents and myself, you know, accumulating all this debt or paying out all this money for something that I don't really want. Um, so really get quiet and honest with yourself and ask, if I achieve this, how will I feel? And if it doesn't feel good, then it's not the right goal for you, right? So when we think about setting our goals and we think about having goals that are meaningful to us and that are putting us um, in closer to what it is that we want. Really, I want you to think about goals like this. Goals are simply a tool to help you identify what you want more of. That's it. Goals are really helping you get clarity and be very uh, clear around what it is that you want more of in your life. Not even less of, right? But what do you want more of? And if we think about, you know, Linda was talking earlier about with the GPS and you're using Waze and you're using, uh, or you're using Google Maps or Apple Maps or whatever it is, right? Goals are the destination of where we want to go, okay? That's it. Goals are the destination of where we want to go. And that's why we want to we want to set shorter term goals, you know, not like 20 year goal. I mean, you can set 20 year goals, but really getting focusing on what do I want in the next year? What do I want in the next five years? And then identifying what can I do in the next 30 days, 90 days to get me closer to that is going to be much more impactful on your life than just focusing on like my five year goal is here. What I'm going to do between now and then I don't know, uh, but that's what I want. Okay. So if we think about our, our goals as being the destination, um, our whole goal setting process is a lot like building up that old, do you guys remember the old AAA, anybody here old enough to remember AAA triptychs? Oh, I used to love the triptych, right? You go down to your AAA office. And it was basically like little maps that you would flip each page. So you would know if you were driving from point A to point B, like where where you, where to look out for, where the construction was, uh, where the speed traps were. AAA was on their game, ma'am. Yes, loved the, love it. Yes, we're like, we love the triptychs, okay? Here's the thing about triptychs and here's the thing about the GPS. Your goal is where you want to end, but you have to know where you're starting. If you don't know where you are, you can't plot a course. You can't plot the course. You have to know where you're starting to know how you're going to get to where you want to end. And so in the 90 day slay, which is uh, the, the goal setting system that I created, we have a five step system to help you set those goals that are going to help you live life by design. Okay. And so it's as easy as uh, the Jackson five taught us as easy as A, B, C. Okay. So we're gonna have five steps, A, B, C, D, E. So the five steps, and I'm going to pop these in the chat just so you have them. Let me copy them real quick. Cause we're going to talk about them. There we go. We're going to talk about uh, a couple. We're going to focus on a couple of them. So the five steps are audit. Audit helps you understand where you are. Then you're going to brainstorm what it is that you want. Capacity is what can you do? And then you're going to define your goal. And then the final step is execute, right? Once you've got your goal, you got to do the work to get there. Okay. Got to do that work. So I want to talk just about the audit because an audit is probably not something that you've considered before, heard before, thought about before. Audit when an IRS does it. When you do it, awesome stuff. And I'm going to pop these questions in the chat for you as well. You can copy these, but this is what I really want you to think about. But before you set your goal, okay, before you set your goal, I want you to think about how content are you in these different areas of your life? How content are you with your physical and mental health? How content are you with your spirituality and your connection to something deeper? How content are you with your financial stability? Financial stability is not the same thing as like your finances, okay? Financial stability is, can I pay the bills that are coming due? 
Because if you can't pay the bills that are like here now, if you're worried about, oh, am I going to be able to pay the light bill, keep the lights on up in here, right? Then you are not really, you shouldn't be focused on, oh, I said should. It's probably not wise to be focused on, you're not going to have the capacity, you're not going to have the bandwidth to be co- focused on relationships and, and bigger sort of bigger things, right? Because everything is going to be, how do I make the money to pay these bills that are due right now so I don't get my power turned off? Uh, how content are you with your relationships, with how you're using your gifts and talents and your career and your influence? How content are you? Content is such a strong word. And it means, it really means like, I'm good. I'm good. And content is about you, not about anybody else, but it's about you. How content are you with these areas? If you are not content in any of those areas, your job is to ask why. Why are you not content? If you're not content with, I'll just use financial stability as an example. Um, why? Is it because you don't have a big enough cushion, right? Well, as you're looking at your audit, again, remember your audit is about where you're starting so that when you build your goals, you you have a better, more accurate view of how how what kind of bridge you need to build, right? If you just wanna save $10 more a month, that's a much easier goal than if you want to, to bring in $5,000 more a month, okay? So we wanna know where we are before we can activate that GPS to know where we wanna go. So once we know um, where we are, we can intuitively sort of target our energy in the right places. So after you've done your audit, you wanna brainstorm. And I love brainstorming because brainstorming is essentially playing. It's like daydreaming. It's giving, taking all the, the shoulds off of ourselves and saying, really, if anything is possible, what is it that I want? And what I like to do in the brainstorming and what I do with my clients in brainstorming is I want you to really get into a year from today. So imagine that it is June 16th, 2024. You have had the best year ever. Best year ever. Okay. You've had the best year ever. You're on the other side of it and you're looking back and you're saying, I can't even believe how amazing this last year was. And you're just writing down what you're grateful for. Because if you can have the best year ever, if you're imagining the best year ever, okay, you're going to have some very specific things that come up. The things that come up for you are the things that actually matter to you. In my best year ever, when I'm looking back at my best year ever, one of the things that I'm the most grateful for is having date nights in the hot tub with my husband. I don't have a hot tub. I didn't know I wanted a hot tub, but as I'm, as I'm sort of putting myself in the future and looking back at what would make this the best year ever, apparently I want a hot tub, right? So now it's a goal. Didn't know that was a goal until I really allowed myself the freedom to just be grateful for whatever the best year would be. Okay. So you want to brainstorm Th- those become the nuggets for your goals. That's, that's where you start understanding what it is that your soul craves, right? The things that you want. The third step um, in my system is capacity. I'm just going to cover it like super briefly. You want to make sure that you have enough time to do the things that you want to do to achieve the goal. And here's what I mean by this. And again, I'm just, I'm super speed going through this fast because we ain't got all day. And if we busted out our math, and busted our calendars and started doing capacity together, y'all would be here for 17 hours and nobody's got time for that. It's Friday, okay? I know y'all have things to do. So I'm just gonna explain what capacity is. I know that in uh, in some, some people, look, look, time is a construct, yes. Time, time has uh, the power that we give it, but there are some sort of basic living on planet earth issues with time that we have to recognize. Okay. Uh, clearly all of this, I am not known for being a super fit person. Okay. A fabulous person. Yes. Super fit. Not so much. If I decided that I wanted to run a marathon, fun fact, I have, uh, I participated in the Disney princess half marathon, but I've never been run. Okay. And I actually didn't finish, but I participated. I wore a tiara. 
I got up at two 30 in the morning. I got a medal. Okay. Um, if I decided today that I wanted to run a marathon, I literally couldn't, I literally couldn't right. Or even a half marathon, 13.1 miles. Couldn't get it done. If I decided I wanted to do that tomorrow, I wouldn't finish. Okay. Because I need time to train. I need time to do the work that will allow me to cross the finish line. If I decided I wanted to make a Thanksgiving dinner tonight for my husband, wouldn't happen. Not a traditional like Thanksgiving dinner. Now, could I go get a Stouffer's uh, Lean Cuisine turkey frozen dinner and pop that bad boy in the microwave and call it Thanksgiving? Sure. That's called creative problem solving. That's not reaching that goal. There, we need time to do the work to achieve our goal. And so when you're looking at your capacity and you're saying, okay, how much time do I reasonably have on a daily basis, on a weekly basis to do the work that I need to do to get to my goal. That's just all capacity is. Um, and then we want to define our goal. Okay. We want to define our goal. Not We're not doing smart goals up in here. We're doing 3D goals. So bust out your 3D glasses. Bust out your 3D glasses. Okay. Here's your 3D goal. You're going to define. You want your goal to be clearly defined. It's got to be definitive. It's not a, uh, I'm going to make more money. Okay. That's not, that's not definite. That's not clearly defined. Okay. So, uh, our definite like outcome number two, it needs to have a deadline, right? When are you going to get this bad boy done? And then number three, and you're going to want to fight me on this and it's okay. It's okay. It needs to be doable. Now here's what I mean by this. You need to be able to do the goal on your own. It can't be incumbent upon someone else doing something for you to achieve the goal. So what I'm really saying here is like your revenue goal is not a great goal. Yes, you have a revenue goal because if you own a business, you need to make money. I get that. I'm not saying don't, don't have financial metrics, but understand what is the work that you're going to do to achieve that goal, right? So is it, is the goal that you're working towards? Is it, um, is the goal, sorry, I saw Joe's comment and I got, I got sidetracked. Uh, well, Joe, yeah. I mean, it should be attainable, right? But if you really focus on definite, um, with a deadline and doable, the work that you're going to do, it will be attainable. Okay. And that's part of that's going to come into your capacity too. So anything's attainable with the right timeline, right? I may not be able to make a Thanksgiving dinner this afternoon, but I could certainly do it in a week. That's adjusting the timeline to make it attainable. Okay. So when we're thinking about doable, a doable goal for me, if I have a revenue goal that I'm working towards, then I say, okay, part of the way that I, that I make my money is through networking and speaking. So I'm going to set goals of, I'm going to go to X amount of networking meetings this quarter. I'm going to speak X amount of times this quarter. I'm going to make X amount of offers this quarter, right? So that I'm focused on what I'm doing. The work is what I'm doing. Cause at the end of the day, I can't control if someone else is going to make the purchase. All I can do is my best to get them there. Right. And I mean, of course, obviously from a, as business owners, as we're looking at like our, re our revenue and sort of those metrics, yes, we need to tweak our goals if, if we're not getting there and look at our systems. But I mean, as we're setting our goals that we're working towards, it's focused on what are you going to do to get there? It needs to be doable by you. Okay. And then the last step is execute. That's actually go out there and do the dang thing. Go do the dang thing. Okay. So I want to give you a little test. I want to wrap up today with a little test. Uh, it's a little woo. Okay. A little test that you can do to see if your goal, to test if your goal is truly in alignment with what matters to you. And so what you're going to do, okay, is you're going to take your thumb. What's it called? Your thumb. And then this first finger, I don't know pointer finger, index finger, I don't know, whatever the first finger is, you're going to make a circle, okay? And you do that on both hands. And then you're going to interlock those. So you've got two hands together. Now you're trying to, thank you, Stephanie, your index finger. You're trying, you, you don't want, this is not like a test of the will. You are not trying to show that you are She-Ra and stronger than anybody else on the planet, but you want to hold them together. And then what you're going to say 
Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you this the whole thing, and it's gonna be confused. I don't know how to best explain this, but so stick with me. What you're gonna say when you're testing your goal, you put your fingers together, and you're gonna say it is in my highest and greatest good to, and then state your goal. So if I were to say it is in my highest and greatest good to charge one million dollars for a one hour call with me, okay. And then you try to pull your fingers apart. So as you say that, try to pull your fingers apart. It is in my highest and greatest good to charge $1 million to work with me. Look, my fingers are like, <laughs> it is not in my highest and greatest good. Okay. It is not. It is in my highest and greatest good to participate in the summit today. Oh, I couldn't pull these apart if I wanted to. My body knows that it is in fact in my highest and greatest good. So. That's a little muscle test that you can do. So as you're baking your goals, and I've done this before, specifically with pricing offers, right? If you have if, if some if you have some discomfort as you're pricing your products, this is a good way to see what does my body say is really, really the right answer here. Okay. Um, so do that for yourself. Remember, if it breaks, it is not in your highest and greatest good. You guys, this was awesome. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I hope this has been helpful for you. I would love to hear more about your goals in the future. Hey. Wendy, thank you so much. I'm blown away. And I have learned that I've been setting goals wrong my entire life. So course correction, detour. <laughs> To close us out today with the incredibly important topic of legacy and life by design, I'm thrilled to introduce Jennifer Hoover. Life by design for this lady is passion for people and properties. She feels purpose in guiding others to create legacy from Domino's Pizza franchisee and raising a family in Maine to Las Vegas, <laughs> real estate and personal growth. Her journey now has her thriving on the Gulf Coast of Mississippi. Jennifer's life design currently includes National Director E-Agent, Managing Director Gulf Coast Polka Dot Powerhouse, Legacy Mentor, Real Estate Investor, Property Manager, Realtor, and health, Mental Health Advocate. Please welcome Jennifer. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. What an exciting day today. And it is just amazing to me after spending a year with these incredible women of how intertwined we have truly, truly be, uh, become and such a support system for each other. <laughs> I do apologize. I picked up a small cold at the beginning of the week, but I am getting so much better. So I want to welcome you today. I'm going to change my view here because it keeps coming up with Laura. I'm going to, I want to welcome you today and say hello and welcome to the rest of your life. You have been given some amazing tools to take with you. And so we want to finish up by giving you the opportunity to create the legacy. I believe so many women, especially women my age, are searching for a passion and a purpose to create a lasting legacy. And here's what I mean, a legacy of a life well lived, full of health and wealth by design, not default. I often work with women that have raised their families, worked a job for many years, taken care of their parents, and now want the opportunity to be seen, to be heard, and to live the life of their dream. I believe, no, I know that this is truly possible for you. <clears throat> and thank you, Laura, for the intro. Yes, I'm Jennifer. I'm a wife, a mother, a grandmother, and a serial entrepreneur. I choose, like Carol said, to wake up and show up every day fabulous. It is on my mirror. When people ask me, how are you? I tell them I'm fabulous because the more I can say it, the more I can believe it. And it's amazing to me how many people will say, oh, I want some of that. 
It's yours if you choose to take it and have it because we're all fabulous in our own right. You just need to own it. A lot of my friends say I have more hours in a day than most people do. Yet I still have freedom. I have freedom to choose where I spend my time, my energy, and my resources. Yes, I do a, a plethora of things that Laura mentioned and take great joy in deciding what those things are. I, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't do anything unless it brings me joy today or I know that it's gonna bring joy for the others around me. So I do have time to enjoy my husband, my family, my friends, and I travel a lot. It wasn't always this way. Like Laura said, we owned a chain of Domino's pizza stores. My husband and I worked about 60 hours a piece each week. We lived the American dream. We had the house, the business, the kids, the cars, and we were trying to be everything to all people. I could drive down the street, worry about all the Domino's pizza stores, all the employees. I could drive, drink a cup of coffee, yell at the kids in the back of the van and be on to the next task in my brain. What was next? What was next? What's for dinner? What does the next person need? I wasn't present in my life. I wasn't present for my husband. I wasn't present for my kids. I definitely wasn't present for myself. And I truly was not a nice person. I was busy and I was important. And I believe people should have known that. If I walked in a store, you needed to take care of me on on my demand and, and serve me the way I wanted to be served. I had no regard for who that person was. Now, you'll often find me asking someone behind the counter, how was your day? And when I ask, I truly mean it today. You see, we don't know what situation they just walked out of. Like Laura, if you had met her on the street today, that beautiful soul, you would have no idea what she just walked from. Do we know that someone just came from a home that their child is ill or has been incarcerated or their husband just beat the crap out of them? We don't know. So finding some grace for people that we meet daily has a huge impact. Like Carol said, being grateful grateful that we could be kind to someone and maybe just change what that moment in their life is right then. It was funny that God or the universe, whomever you believe in, always gives us a sign, right? We got a big one. In the midst of doing all those fantastic things, we had a child that became very, very ill. She was in the middle of a mental health crisis. It took, from the time she was about 13 to 17, she tried to take her own life at least eight times. It was really, really trying on our family. You're still trying to raise the other kids and keep her alive. And priorities change drastically. You see, keeping her alive one more day was a bit more important than selling one more pizza. And the homeless man on the street becomes a human. It's someone's dad or brother or father. And I had never looked at them that way before because I had never been in the shoes to realize that how much of a mental crisis, health crisis, mental health crisis we have in this world today. Um, it was a big wake up call for us. Now I'm grateful to say she is very well today and, and an amazing person. 
So I want you, and like some of the others have spoken about, to think about your goals and dreams. But I want you to close your eyes just a little bit and think about what they were when you were a little girl. When you thought about, what do I want out of my life? Did you want to travel the world and be on all continents? Did you want to serve in a ministry? Did you want to marry the person of your dreams? Did you want to be a doctor or a nurse or a teacher? Whatever those were, they would light you up. You'd get butterflies in your tummy and your eyes would get excited. Society kind of tampers that down. And all the people in our life that love us and want what's best for us, like Wendy said, put us on a trajectory or a path that they feel is best, but they don't know what's in your heart, right? So when you think about what it felt like, have you ever sat down since and said, what do I really want my life to be? The rest of it, who do I wanna be? What do I wanna do? What do I wanna have? Not what society has told us, to go to school, to get a good grade, to get into a good college, to get a good job. And our brain doesn't work that way that there we're always searching for that next great thing. We need to be happy in between. We need to be fabulous today. Um, there's, I don't know if there's any millennials here and I know millennials take a lot of crap for a lot of stuff, but there's some things I'm very grateful for. Millennials have taught us to drop all of the keep up with the Joneses sort of thing. You know, if just because you had the big beautiful house and the boat and the car, and there was this big facade that everything on the inside was perfect. Well, we know that's not true anymore. And so I'm thankful millennials said, those are not our priorities. And they've kind of, that, that next generation up made us realize why, why did we work so hard for that? Yes, they can bring us instant gratification and bragging rights, but are they bringing you true joy? Now look, if you have a car and I have a 66 Mustang that I love, it's my baby. When I get in that car, I feel special. That's mine. It embodies who I am and my spirit and the fun I wanna have in the rest of my life. So if there's a particular, <clears throat> excuse me, house or car or something that you want, that you truly feel amazing in and brings you joy, then have that. But not just because the neighbor next door has one. There's a big difference there. So I want you to do, have, and be all the things that you want. If you think about it, competition is the thief of our joy and fulfillment. This really hit me hard. I had a conversation with our daughter, the one that had been very ill a few years ago. She was getting married and we were having a you know, conversation around the kitchen table and she said, you know, I'm, I'm just never gonna be as successful as you and dad. And it truly hurt my heart. Now, She's married to an amazing person that we love. She's alive, which is amazing in its own right. She has a home and she has a couple of apartments that she owns. She's an assistant dean at, a, at an exclusive private college and has done amazing things with her mental health. To me, not only the things that she's done, but who she's become is amazing. And it hurt me that she thought she had to compare herself to our success. You see, success gets to be defined by you. Only you get to decide what success is. Mother Teresa died penniless. 
is is there anyone here that can tell me she was a failure? What was the legacy she left? What an amazing light in the world she was. With not a penny to her name. So please don't let society or the people that love us define what your success is. It's what's on your heart from God or the universe. What lights you up, right? So what's one tiny step you can do right now to declare that? Write it on that piece of paper, own it. Have you ever sat and really considered what is a perfect day or a perfect year like Wendy talked about? What does that look like to you? How does it feel? Do you put your feet on the floor and there's a pink fluffy rug? Do you throw back the curtains in the morning and there's this beautiful seascape? Like, where do you want to be? What do you want to eat? Where do you want to drive? Where do you want to live? Who do you want to be? That's your success and you get to define it. You need to think, sit down and truly think about what that looks like to you. So I recently also had a dear friend that was a Domino's Pizza franchisee. We'd been friends with them for about 39 years. He finally decided to sell his store. He and his wife worked in the store seven days a week, about 16 hours a day. And the store was supposed to sell last Monday. A week before it sold, he died in his sleep. Now there were lots of lessons in that. And at first I was really angry. I was angry at him. Angry because he didn't plan on dying and he hadn't set things up for his wife correctly and she's kind of in a mess. And two, he had, they had worked so hard their entire lives to be able to retire and travel together because they'd have all this money. And he died before it all happened. So she feels robbed and I don't blame her, right? So live today, be fabulous today, be glorious today. What is that legacy that you're leaving? Laura talked about, you know, her granddaughter is watching her. And, and I feel the same way, right? Like I've already messed up my kids. Now I have grandkids. And what an amazing opportunity to share these gifts and lessons that we have now with a younger generation so they can learn these so much sooner in life than we had the opportunity to. We weren't taught these things in school and I don't really remember my mom talking about much of this stuff, right? So how wonderful is it that now we get to share this today with each other and grow from each other? So Huber Legacy is all about the gifts we leave. It's not about the money, but the legacy about what will your friends say? What will your family say? It's about remembering to be present in your life today. Our souls are not hungry for fame, comfort, wealth, or power. Our souls are hungry 